verstehe Deutsch. Sie können Fragen auf Deutsch stellen, aber kann nicht gut genug Deutsch sprechen. Äh, und jetzt wechsle ich die Sprache des Imperialismus und so weiter. Okay, uh, I will do something, use even some jokes and stories that you may know, because I really want to tell two anecdotes, because I don't like to celebrate my nation. But I think for Merlus, what this means, and why is this concept actual today, we in Slovenia got the answer 100 years ago already. It's not a nice story. You know, everybody celebrates Slovenia here, but I read now Nazi history, because I will begin with it. You know who was maybe the worst single person? He invented gas chambers and so on, Odilo Globocznik. He is a Slovene and he is the worst of them all. So we Slovenes know where we are. Let me begin by a story which is, maybe you know it, but it's my favorite story. Years ago, I was watching, uh, I was reading that Nazis in their uh, camps had something that I find horrible. One of the ways of them to torture in the camps was to crash the testicles. And they had industrially made a ball testicle crasher. So before using this, I wanted to check it up and I put search Google, no, uh, uh, testicle crashers. And I found about 10 companies offering them today some cost over 500 euros. They're exquisitely made, very beautiful. You regulate how much you crash your testicles. Then you have special needles to put them in. And uh, 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 that's the publicity. Pick your poison from, for pleasure from this ball torture group, stainless steel ball crusher, stainless ball clamp torture, and so on and so on. This, I think, is where we are today. The passage from the ball crusher, the way Nazi used them as torture, now you have to buy it, and uh, we are supposed, obviously, to enjoy it. So my question is, how did we come to this today? Because my claim is here a pretty crazy radical one. This awaits us at the end of today's... Uh, sorry? Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, basically... Okay, I will go on here till that one. Okay, okay. <laughs> Ah, you don't want to be quoted as telling about ball crashing. No, 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 yeah. a, no. I think, a... I have no doubt that, that uh, there are some people who will celebrate this as a, that's what I wanted to see you, as a sign of historical progress. Today, if you use one wrong word, which is considered uh, too binary or so ever, you are cancelled. But no problem to do the uh, ball crashing and so on. The serious problem behind this apparent joke is, my God, why, uh, why are we today at this stage where, with all the permissiveness, we get more and more frigidity and impotence? Pleasure is today almost order as Iberi super ego. You have to enjoy. And uh, Can you put now use this okay. one? Yeah. it goes yes, perfectly. Wonderful. And the result is through pain. So where do we Slovenes have the answer? In 1922, uh, a Trieste psychoanalyst, Italian, Eduardo Weiss, had written to Freud about his problem with two patients. One was a highly educated Italian whose wife has committed suicide and uh, 
this made him impotent with the typical male chauvinist exception, except with prostitutes. But he was impotent. Then the second person was a Slovene, about 20 years of age, a truly immoral person. He cheated everybody. Like the analyst learned, Weiss, that his father gave him the money for analysis, but this Slovene told to his father a higher sum so that he pocketed the difference and so on, but that's my paradox. Yes, he was extremely corrupted, immoral, a liar, but at the same time, he was completely impotent. So that's the paradox. The transgression of all ethical social laws did not lead to unbridled pleasure, it led to its prohibition. The more everything is allowed, the more it is at a different level prohibited. Here, we will not have time to go into this today, but here, Lacan was right and Dostoevsky was wrong. In this, I think, one of the most stupid statements in the history of human thought. If there is no God, then nothing is forbidden. No, the Slovene shows that if there is no God, then everything is forbidden. Uh, and what was Freud, uh, Freud's advice to Weiss? He said the first patient, okay, it's normal, he felt guilt for, guilt for his wife's death, so he, uh, you will cure him, it's normal moral pressure. But for Slovene, I quote Freud, unfortunately in English, the Slovene is obviously a good for nothing who does not warrant your efforts. Our psychoanalytical art fail, fails when faced with such people. Our perspicacity alone cannot break through the dynamic relation which controls them. So, did you notice the ambiguity of Freud? He said at the same time, he is worthless, ignore him, and he is too complex. Psychoanalysis is not enough develop. I think that Freud's mistake here was that uh, he saw this guy as totally immoral and so on, but we should here introduce Lacan's notion of Liberich as not the same as uh, Ich Ideal or moral law. Moral law prohibits. Iberich, as Lacan put it very nicely, Iberich, superego, is an agency of enjoyment. The basic order of superego is enjoy fully. And precisely, paradoxically, this sabotages most efficiently uh, enjoyment. So uh, this is, I think, uh, where we are uh, today. Uh, uh, our official culture, culture is everything is permitted, uh, but so that really everybody has ac access to enjoyment, we get so many regulations, what you are allowed, what not, and so on and so on. And this brings me to go quickly to the basic paradox of Iberich, elaborated already by Freud. It is that the more you obey its orders, the more you feel guilty. It's not, okay, I did my duty, it's okay. No, we are caught in this circle or of the more you obey it, the more you feel, uh, the more you feel uh, guilty. Uh, uh, and this, again, I think, happened to this Slovene. And again, this is our superego culture today. Now I will say something that you will, uh, that you will uh, uh, not uh, like, maybe. But I think this is the problem of, which is why I remain today especially. Now I provoke you even more than with all those testicle stories. 
This is why I'm sorry to tell you, as a leftist and communist, I remain Eurocentrist. I claim that, that uh, don't we get it that the more the so-called leftist liberals criticize Eurocentrism, uh, the, the most ridiculous here was Foucault, who went to Iran and claimed, uh, your culture is infinitely better, there is nothing more oppressive than Western European culture, but the paradox of this struggle against neocolonialism, Eurocentrism, and so on, is that we expect that if we behave in an anti-racist way, that we will be, this will be received by the other side benevolently. No, it's the opposite. The more we try to be tolerant, open to the other, the more we hear. You don't really like us, this is just hypocrisy, we want more, and so on and so more. So that's, and here comes the, why then are we doing it? Here enters, then I will quickly finish, here enters, I think, the uh, Iberich und Mer, Merlus oder Mer Genissi. When you, the more you feel guilty, sorry, the more you obey the order, the more you feel guilty. Why? Because this guilt is pleasure at its purest. And this is Iberich as opposed to simple pleasure. I'm so sorry we don't have time, it would be too complicated, but if you want to see one clip, what is mere plus? Surplus pleasure, which is pleasure in renunciation itself. Mere plus, it's not simply more plus, like, sorry for being tasteless, a lady says, or a man, whoever. I want to be fucked in this way, but if you do that more, it will be even better. No, it's that you enjoy the very prohibition, the horror. The nicest example imaginably, I hope you know it, it's a true historical moment. Look, Joseph Goebbels, you know that famous uh, uh, Berlin Sport Palace speech from early 43, he announces totales Greek, and it's an incredible speech. He doesn't even speak a lot about Enzik. He just promises horrors with an incredible, full of intense mystical enjoyment expression of his face. You want total Greek, such a word that you cannot even imagine the horrors. The crowd shouts, yes, we want it. Then Gables goes on, you want to suffer, to have hardship to, uh, with regard to which what we suffered till now was nothing. Yes, we want it, and so on. That's where today, especially uh, uh, psychoanalyse, psychoanalysis enters. Uh, psychoanalysis, in psychoanalysis, genus, Full pleasure is, that's the beautiful paradox, at the same time impossible, but at the same time impossible to get rid of it. For example, let's say something is prohibited, in classical Freudian terms, incest. It's never that what you really want. But then if you obey prohibitions, you start to enjoy prohibitions themselves, or as my personally good friend, but theoretically half enemy, Judith Butler likes to say, the lesson of psychoanalysis is that the prohibition of desire necessarily changes into a desire for prohibition. So no matter how you try to be Puritan, to get rid of it, enjoyment returns. You see the paradox, it's impossible, you always miss it, but at the same time, you cannot, you, uh, at the same time, uh, you cannot get rid of it. And to provoke you even more, although all my best friends, no, the usual anti-Semitic statement is some of my friends are Jews. No, practically all of my friends are Jews. <laughs> but that's why I'm telling you, uh, I was, here is super egologic at its worst, I was horrified 
to read in Der Spiegel, I think a year and a half or two ago, they debated BDS, boycott, divest, and sanction, whatever, and uh, two big uh, Jewish figures in Germany said something which for me is horrible. They said, I quote it in German, their anti-Semit is bestimmt der Jude und nicht der potentielle anti-Semit. My point, okay, I agree, but what if we apply the same to West Bank Palestinians? Can we also say, they will say when they are oppressed? The second thing, what about all those Jews who don't agree, and there are hundreds of thousands demonstrating, who don't agree with this oppression on the West Bank? Uh, 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 Zionists had an expression, horrible, self-hating Jews. Jews who only pretend to be Jews but are not really Jews. And here, to conclude, I give you what I see as a horror today. The term I proposed it 10 years ago, it's now accepted among Israeli left, whatever remains of it. Uh, we have a new phase of uh, anti-Semitic Zionism. Literally. You know who is at the beginning of it? You should read him. Horrible name. Also not bad, as bad as Globotsky. We are the worst. Uh, Reinhard Heydrich. In 37, he wrote a text where he says, Jews are wonderful, dynamic people. We would like to make geschäfte with them and so on, plus they don't belong here. Like, out of, they, we should throw them out from here, but they are more, more than welcome in Palestina, when they will serve as a limit to Western, to Oriental barbarism. Then, you remember that guy, what was his name? Uh, Breivik, the crazy guy in Norway. He said the same. He said, Jews in Europe, no, no, they make trouble. Jews in Israel, nothing better, we should support them. And the sad thing is, take somebody like uh, 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 Donald Trump. He enacted this politics. He fully supported Israel there, told them to simply annex Golan Heights and so on. At the same time, if you look at his support base in the United States, it's mo mostly people who were not even in a very covered way uh, uh, anti-Semitic. So, uh, to really conclude, believe me or not, uh, 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 who is then my ethical hero? I will not quote her, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, too, too long, but it's an in incredible lady, Ruth Glüger. He wrote memoirs, he was as a young girl in Auschwitz or where, uh, still alive, a girl, Holocaust girl who remember. And her message is very deep. I will condense it, but, uh, maybe it's in the book if you want to learn more. She says that she survived Holocaust. Then she went to Israel and was shocked at how some of her friends who also survived Holocaust were there extremely aggressive about uh, Palestinians, like this is now our land, kill them and so on. And her explanation is very deep. She said, we are still victims of this prejudice that Holocaust, yeah, yeah, horrible, blah, blah, but ethically it purified you. And she said, no, Holocaust, it wasn't if you survive it, you came out with a refined sense for justice or whatever. No, she said, the problem is that many were also ethically destroyed. Uh, Holocaust was not for those who survived a factory for good people and so on. So, to really conclude, if there is a hero of 20th century for me, the first heroes of 21st century are the Iranian women, what they are doing now. Can you imagine anything more foreign to political correctness? But can you imagine anything more emancipatory 
women rejected to wear burqa all day, and the, the, they are supported, they insist, they risk their, they risk their lives, and what is important? For me, the problem of political correctness is that it focuses on divisions. Like, uh, if I were, or if you were, much easier to judge me, you would say, okay, you pretend to be a leftist, but didn't you use that bad taste jokes? Didn't you do that? It's divisive. Why? What women did now in Iran is the exact opposite. They are, and speaker with that mandat, triggering an incredible uh, protest movement, all ordinary people, even many freedom-loving Muslims said, yes, the lesson is our, uh, our uh, Ayatollahs who are running, ruling us are not true Muslims and so on, and it's very important that women did this. It's an incredible element. So, uh, really to conclude, my hero of the 20th century, remember this name, check it in uh, 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 Wikipedia or web, Marek Edelman. He was a Bund leftist Jew in Poland. He was one of the leaders of ghetto uprising. By imagine he survived it. He was then one of the leaders of uh, final Warsaw uprising. He survived that. After the war, he remained in Poland. And the authorities wanted him to go out. And he gave a beautiful explanation. He said, there are all those stones, and he was very precise here. He said, forget Auschwitz. Auschwitz is, I'm totally provocative now, Auschwitz is a, a, a gulag Disneyland today. You know that I learned this, David Irving, that's the only thing I learned from him. He is horrible. But you know that what you are shown as that chamber for, to guest people, it says there, it was built on 48, in 48 after. The true horrors are uh, um, Sobibor, uh, Majdanek, Treblinka, and so on. They were taught, so he said, it's not important what I say. I feel like a stone in one of these camps. It's just my duty to be here. Then a true heroism. When Palestinians begin to revolt, he said, please don't use terror, but otherwise you are my brothers. It was an incredible ethic, and with this I will really, really conclude the third time. You know, don't fall into this trap. The moment you do this, you sold your soul to the devil. If you say, okay, Israelis exaggerate a little bit, Palestinians exaggerate a little bit, let's find the right measure. No, if you balance it like this, you know, then you justify both. Israelis can say, we suffered Holocaust, so you don't have any right to reproach us. Palestinians are saying, we suffer such a law that we don't care about Holocaust, we suffer now. No, the only ethical position is our fight against anti-Semitism, which is strong here in Europe, and our fight for West Bank Palestinian rights should be logically, consistently part of the same struggle. There is no balancing here. On this, all, all depends. Ich wiesach das in Karl May Wiener to how ich habe gesprochen. Ja, ja, hier brauche ich auch noch Saft. Ähm, meine Fragen sind beantwortet und wollen, ich reiche sie kurz nach. Ich wollte eigentlich fragen, was die Paradoxien sind. Da haben wir jetzt einige Beispiele gehört. Ich wollte fragen, was die Mehrlust ist. Das haben wir erklärt bekommen. Und jetzt wollte ich nochmal ähm, fragen, wer sind, was sind die Nichtverwirkungen? Les ah, non du. Ja, also von eine der schönsten, one of the most beautiful sayings of Jacques Lacan, but as everything you find it in Hegel, or in Hegel already, is that uh, 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 Lacan, with a wonderful ambiguity, says, le nom du père. Those who are not tricked 
those who don't fall into the trap of the illusion, those, precisely those who want to know everything clear, they are, uh, they are wrong. And your question was, well, ah, for nicht verwirrten. I think that today we live in a totally crazy era. I explained this already yesterday a little bit, where, you know, it's not so much that the truth is not told. Even those in power are saying at the level of content the right things. Like, look at the Glasgow conference two years ago about, the, they said we are on the brink of a catastrophe, action is needed, and so on and so on. But the way it functions is that we talk about doing thing, things in a non-engaged way, in such a way that we guarantee that nothing will happen. Sorry to repeat myself, yesterday I used the two examples where if I were to be a terrorist, I would bomb them immediately. Kassel und Venedig Art Biennales. Look at their program. You cannot imagine anything more leftist radical. We are a tool of capitalism. There is still Eurocentric racism. We are all exploited. It doesn't matter. They fit this Biennales perfectly into a global market. So our this here I refer to your philosopher, who is a right winger, but I wouldn't underestimate him. I still consider him my friend, Peter Sloterdijk, who 30 years ago wrote a wonderful book about a uh, uh, critique der Zinnischen Vernunft, where he said the formula today is we know what we are doing but we are nonetheless doing it. So, and here I refer to my wife, who unfortunately, where is she, is here, who is now writing a book, Le Nom du Air, where he shows how what is wrong today is precisely this obsession with not falling into an illusion. Like, like you know, the whole modern art is this. Uh, uh, the, even Brecht, although with Brecht is more complex, this idea of entfremdung, don't take it too seriously, and so on, I think that this is the main enemy today. I think that as Hegel puts it, the path to truth goes only through illusions. You have to consciously engage yourself in something which may appear illusory. So, of course, to go back to the point, I told this title from, I'm so old, Sinai, who wrote that famous book, uh, A Guide for the Perplexed. Maimonides. Yeah, Maimonides, yes. Where the idea is you are perplexed, confused. No, today, guidance need those who think in a very cynical way everything is clear. And then you get the conclusions. Yes, the situation is catastrophic, but the, as everything that you do will turn things even worse. Like, in spite of my irony against political correctness, I still absolutely <coughs> sorry, support it, its basic goals and LGBT and so on. For me, the problem is not they are too crazy, too radical. They are, in some sense, not radical enough. They don't address the true causes of women's subordination and so on and so on. It's, an, I really think, and many of my Marxist friends agree that, for example, in the United States, this politically correct wokeness and so on is strictly an upper middle class phenomenon. But let me not lose time here. My point, so this is the idea. Today, we all think either in conspiracy theories or in global cynicism, don't take that seriously, everything goes wrong, and so on, and so on. No, we have to take the risk. Maybe it will go wrong, but then we repeat it, it may be better. This was even Hegel's point, much more refined in his, because I'm an old Robespierre fan, to the end, in his critique of French Revolution, it's not terror and so on. 
No, his point is that to arrive at, under quotation marks, normal bürgerliche Gesellschaft, you have to go through terror. You have to go through illusion. So today I would say we need more fictions, we need more alternate realities. Yesterday my wife mentioned a movie which we both agree, I often disagree with her, she is evil, but here I agree with her, that did you see the movie Everything Everywhere? That's a total fake, because beneath this playing with alternatives, the result is that the world in which we live is still the best one, return to this world. No, sorry, the world we live in is definitely not the best one imaginable. We have to take risks, so we have to, we have to be in some sense, you know, I will use another, I don't think I already use it in this book, I use it in one text. It doesn't work in your language, uh, in my Slovene so-so, but it works in French and maybe some others. It's a wonderful distinction between, you know, in French you have two words for future, zukunft, <laughs> for future and avenir. Future means what will be. Avenir means something more, like uh, if Biden will win, he will be the present and future president of America. But he will not be the president to come. It has to be different. And here comes my pessimist optimism. We need to get to true avenir. Would it be ankunst or what? I don't know. We have to accept no future. By this I mean no future within the general coordinates of the existing order. In, in this sense, again, uh, uh, don't ever underestimate. That's why I think the, uh, today's the system more and more reproduces itself by bribing us with different forms of mere loose. Look at precarious work. You almost cannot be more exploited. But you know where they bribe you? Many workers that I know with Uber, taxi fahrer, say, but I'm so free. I work only when I want. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I can cancel weekends to be free. Uh, nobody controls me and so on. You see, this is a typical way how, although exploitation is worse than ever, today uh, the system presents this exploitation as new freedoms. They use a beautiful metaphor here, that we are all capitalists. If you are a poor worker and somehow put aside 3,000 euros, you are a small capital, because then you have to think, Will I buy a cheap car and become, uh, 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 become uh, uh, the Uber driver? Will I finance my son's studies? Will we go to a holiday? So the idea is you just add a couple of zeros, but it doesn't really matter. It gives you a fake sense of freedom, which is why I think in some sense today the, the horror with freedom is that we with unfreedom is that we experience it as freedom and we are so many you know the story i believe my friend although i often don't agree with him especially with ukraine yanis varoufakis who said we are already entering a new neo-feudal order where uh, those who control the clouds where the, the digital clouds where all the data are collected you cannot understand them as, uh, as uh, people who are obsessed with profit. It's not first, it's not profit, it's rent. How, how, why is Bezos so rich? Because when you buy it, it's not even you, it's mostly the publishers, no? To publish there it takes 30% of whatever, you are paying him a rent. That's the horror today. You think you are in a free space, choosing, I buy this, I buy that. It's all controlled by 
digital cloud, which even then manipulate your choices, your desires, and so on and so on. And we all work for them. You know how? By clicking, by making choices, and so on. They know us, as we say, much better than we know ourselves. So my paradoxical conclusion is that, yes, it's a horrible situation. The liberal subject is disappearing. But a proper dose of communism, not the old DDR Central Committee, but let's say socialized economy and so on, is the only way for what is worth fighting for in liberalism to survive. Genosse, Deutsch, we have this problem from gestern. It is Genosse and Genossi. But what if I say, fuck you, I'm non-binary, what in English you have to use they? Do you have here a version? How do you do it of Deutsch? You say Genossin. Bitte? Genossin. There's a small space. Yeah, but this is still binary. It means you are maybe man, maybe woman. But there are people who say we are neither. Okay, so I'm now expert. Vielleicht weiß jemand, jemand? No, 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 it's not. Uh, sorry, let's skip it. Please, let's go on. Uh, eine Frage hätte ich jetzt noch zum Schluss. Yeah. Um, wir haben jetzt die Paradoxien kennengelernt. Das wollte ich. Yeah. So das, I, ich könnte sagen, mit aller Hypokrisie, ich, I would love to answer a question endlessly, but unfortunately there is no time and so on. Yeah. You know, but at least symbolically, one, we should allow one person or two to. Symbolisch können wir eine Frage noch zulassen, aber... Wo sind wir? Wir sind jetzt... Ähm, wir sind noch fünf, vier, sechs Minuten. Genau. Äh, eigentlich wollte ich noch eine Frage stellen, aber das wäre jetzt natürlich unfair, wenn das Publikum die Chance hat. Einer darf jetzt was fragen, Sie sind der Erste, dann Deutsch fragen Sie. Bitte? Können Sie ganz Deutsch wollen. fragen? Vielleicht in das Mikro hier. Das ist für mich eine Frage wie Coca-Cola oder Fanta. Aber ich wollte Fanta, aber dann habe ich gelernt, wissen Sie, was Fanta war? Wenn in 1939 uh, United States prohibited to sell Coca-Cola to Germany, it's Hitler's answer to Coca-Cola. <laughs> Sorry, please, whatever you want. Okay, also ich habe einmal einen Kommentar zu dem äh, Auschwitz Disneyland. Das ist, äh, also Bulak Disneyland, das ist genau meine Erfahrung gewesen, als ich dort war. Das erste, was ich gesehen habe, war eine Amerikanerin, die ein Selfie gemacht hat. Ja, die ja. Arbeit macht frei Schild und sie hat symbolisches Kapital dadurch, dass sie dann irgendwie in Auschwitz war und ja, sagen kann, dass ja. sie dort war. Ähm, anderes Disneyland, wir haben in Dresden, äh, ich komme aus Dresden, wir haben da einen Techno-Club und das ist ein Spielplatz für Erwachsene, da gibt es Techno, bum bum bum, da gibt es, äh, was weiß ich, Kunst, Kultur, Theater und der Name von diesem Club heißt Objekt Klein A. Das heißt, oh mein Gott. Genau, und das heißt, wir gehen da jede Woche hin und versuchen das Objekt Klein A zu fangen und wir kriegen es nicht und dann müssen wir nächste Woche wieder ja. hingehen. Das ist der Part. Und äh, der zweite Teil von der Geschichte ist, ich habe dort meinen Geburtstag gefeiert im Januar, 35 Jahre. Und ich habe ein Geschenk gekriegt, es war Hermann Lang, die Sprache und das Unbewusste. Ich will ja, und das war ihr so Buch. Wie und das war ihr Buch, nee. weil mein Freund hat das gefunden in einem Antiquariat in äh, Ljubljana, wo ganz viele Bücher von ihm sind und er hat sich diese Fetischobjekte gekauft, 20, 30 Das darf ich kurz dazu Und hat nicht eins davon, äh, hat er mir geschenkt. Also, ich wollte ja, wir wollten uns eigentlich auf Fragen ähm, konzentrieren und äh, nicht auf Co-Referate, so interessant sie sein mögen. Jetzt wollen wir es nochmal, Entschuldigung, er hat ähm, nochmal, können Sie das Mikro gerade weitergeben? Nein, die, die, die erste Frage war, war sehr interessant. <lacht> äh, nach, weil, äh, yes, there is something totally false in the way Auschwitz functions. I think it's too hypocritical to say, oh, these are stupid purists. Well, they made it like that. The way Auschwitz is struck is very clear, very clean, like when with my son I visited Dachau, they have one barrack with nice newly made beds, and my son's next was, wait a minute, this is better as any can this a student hotel, and I would quite like to stay there, bitte. Ja, erstmal vielen Dank, dass ihr auch das Thema Iran angesprochen habt. Ich komme aus der Stadt, wo äh, junges Mädchen Gina Massavini getötet wurde und die Revolution begann yes. aus meiner Heimatstadt. Aber wie sehen die Dinge jetzt? Ja, das ist genau. Ja, jetzt geht es weiter, die Revolution geht, 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 es geht weiter. weiter. Genau, das ist ein Prozess, es kann sein, auch, dass es etwas länger dauert, als wir uns <lacht> wünschen. Ja, aber meine Frage wäre an Sie, was können 
europäische Feministen oder europäische äh, Linke einfach von den äh, von dieser Xinjiang also die Revolution lernen, weil äh, manchmal ich studiere auch in der Uni und wenn ich manchmal bestimmte Debatten höre, dann denke ich ja, mir, worüber ja, die Rede. Ich verstehe. In this desperate situation, I would say something very simple. Stop this uh, divisive approach where the left, you know, uh, most of this uh, uh, woke left doesn't even bother a lot to criticize true racists. They are what they are. But they have this hermeneutic of suspicions. Are you really, are you not secretly a fascist? But you use that expression there and so on, you know. And I, I think, first solution is a very naive one. What I, I don't idealize here, but what, from what I know, I admire there, is this, uh, the magical moment is when something that appears a particular problem, we mean uh, Burka, that uh, it, uh, it be triggered a universal process. And so, sorry to say this very cynical thing, but if I were those up, Ayatollahs, wouldn't you do the same? I would say as a great gesture, okay, if you want just something very small, you don't need burka and so on. And then, uh, uh, then comes the critical point where, but that's a complicated theory, here I think I'm a true uh, feminist. You know people usually say feminism is uh, hysterical. Yeah, but for Lacan, hysteria is the most authentic position. Hysteria knows about objecta and merlus. The formula of hysteria is uh, 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 I want this from you, but even if you give me this, it is not that. And the, it's not simply this insatiable desire, I want more, more, more. It's the hysterical truth is, no matter what you give me, I want more. Not to kill you, but that you substantially change the very order in which you are in a position of giving me these cramps, a little bit more freedom here, there, and so on, and so on. So, uh, in the West, we should simply step out of these divisive struggles, you know, and uh, learn, this is the only good guy, one of the few for me is in the United States, Bernie Sanders. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is already playing some double game and so on. So this uh, movement towards solidarity, you know, like, let's say you are against abortion. I am, of course, absolutely for free abortion. But we should say, no, okay, we will agree with you, no compromise here. But what if in the first step we propose a measure which in the long term will help our, help our cause. Like, let's say, not you, but some of you is against a boss. Then my answer would not have been, oh, you are a proto-fascist or whatever, but okay. But you know, nobody likes a boss. But you know, what is the cause of a boss? The first I would, uh, the cause, not cause. First I would attack those, this is part of the ruling ideology, they always impose us this fake image that abortion, these are these middle class spoiled women, no, they know about protection. The largest case of abortion is poor women, even unwanted sex, who already have three children, cannot abort anyone. So my proposal to you would be, let's then together because abortion is painful and so on, fight the causes, better health care for families and so on. I, I don't make a compromise. I would never say, so okay, we make a compromise, no abortion. No, no, we stand there, but look for larger solidarity. And the next thing, I cannot emphasize it enough, in a, yeah, a sense of elementary sense of Iron. I always suspect that the fanaticism, be it the religiously fundamentalist or woke, is a sign of inner weakness. 
you are really afraid of the enemy. For me, the, the true struggle against racism, and only here, I remember wonderfully old Yugoslavia, before the 80s. It was full of racist jokes, but of one nation against the other, but made in the benevolent way. Like we Slovenes had jokes about ourselves, we were telling them to Serbs, Serbs had jokes about themselves, Albanians and so on. And this worked as a wonderful solidarity. We didn't idealize ourselves.